that we're doing. Uh, it's you know it's one thing to talk about, it's another thing to see it. Um, but yeah, we have one location uh, mainly in the or Cajun Library, but in addition to that, we have a second location at the West Campus. So we have two areas across ASU, and as you know, ASU is so huge. So, uh, so we definitely have uh, different areas. Excuse me. Sorry. Okay. And so within that, um, you know, we're able to do cool stuff, and I'll get into that in a moment. Let's see. Okay, so anyways, back to this part, and you know, now this is the part where most folks will have a plan acknowledgement statement. I opt not to do that because I'm awesome. I'd rather to show you. Obviously, you're in Arizona, you're tribe in Arizona. In the case of awesome, you know, Hula River Indian community, Salt River Kingdom America Indian community, Auction, Don Austin, and even the Couch Valley in Mexico. Gotta know where you're at. And ASU sits on uh, these territories along with this university, and more so, um, obviously, ancestrally, this is what it looks like. And the reason I stress this is because when we're doing this work, you have to know where you're at if you're talking about supporting Native students. Because if not, we're just perpetuating settler colonialism by with our settler privilege of not caring about whose land you're on. So myself, as an awesome, as a director in this library, in this huge academic space, it is kind of a, a head trip, right? Because usually people like me are never in these roles and or forced to move elsewhere because that's how academia works. That said, I'm here, I have a team now, and we're able to do the work we're about to share in a second. So again, here's the team. And so uh, this is to know, again, to cultivate these spaces around data sovereignty, you need people. And so, and also get into the range of meeting uh, community students, faculty, where they're at. So we have Lina Begay as our librarian slash archivist, and then our program team with Eric Hardy and we'll talk to Largo Anderson. And this is huge for up uh, ASU because again, Libriola was a staff of one and at best a handful of student workers. And I think we all in this room know with the archives, with anything with librarianship, you need people. And so um, although, you know, four, right, obviously advocated for more, but uh, four is a good foundation. And so within that, we can get into cultivating spaces where we can start to engage students on these larger conversations around indigenous librarianship. So for those who don't know, and I hope you do know because we're here at high school, indigenous librarianship is a global movement, right? This has been happening for 30, 40 years, even beyond. You know, I'm not sure when the first librarian, native librarian used it, but here we are. And it provides framework, right? It provides us to center our perspective, our values, our protocols within what we do as librarians and archivists. And knowing that it touches on all these points there in the bubbles, which I won't break down everyone, but to know again that emphasis on place, you know, the, the emphasis on just having that relation to the land and just obviously with protocols to benefit the community. Because I think we all signed up for this program or this profession because we want to help. But for Native people, there's a lot of history to unpack because of the nature of how this country has been formed. And, and before this, because for awesome, we've gone to the Spanish Empire, to the Mexican, uh, uh, in Mexico and now the U.S. And so this is going to change, hopefully in different ways. But again, indigenous librarianship takes that all into account. And so within that, there's this part. So with students, right, back to community, back to the average Native person on the reservation, when you bring up libraries, archives, they don't maybe think of me or any other Native librarian. They probably think of this image, right, because that's all they know. And so for us at ASU and within our space and community, is to show who we are by right? inserting all the staff that we mentioned to make a space where we can talk about culture resiliency, talk about decolonization. And you don't have to do Indian 101 with a non native librarian who doesn't know who the hell you are. And or assume since I'm native, I'm Navajo or Mohawk or some like cliche Hollywood, you know, branding of us, right? I'm awesome, right? Know where you're at. And so with our team, you know, we're able to engage our students with that framework. Because from there, they can begin to see themselves in the library and feel welcome in the library and then be, be introduced to big academic terms like decolonization or data sovereignty, or whatever, which is the point of this talk. But that said, you know, like I was saying, more elaborate, you know, this is a train of thought, value systems, it takes into account colonization, right? Each of these things, think about it, you know, whether it's cataloging, whether it's uh, creating finding aids, whether it's just uh, looking up articles for uh, you know, a review, colonization has impacted our information, right? The nature of settler colonialism is the settler has now set up a colony that influences the lands that they have now stolen. And so within that, it's definitely had impacted our books, right? It's impacted our archive, it's impacted every printed form. And so the reason I stress that is because at Labriola, that's the approach we take to meet our students where they're at. 
because they understand that it's not their fault they can't find information. It's not their fault that you know um, they're triggered by some problematic terminology in a you know old 1960s ethnographic book and so on. And so they need folks like ourselves, indigenous librarians, to be able to navigate that. And so within it, again, I'm going to go full circle back to the point of this talk, but is, you know, with that vision, you know, the make a space where we can support indigenous resiliency and scholarship through cultural expression, for memory keeping, and also community learning, but ultimately to bolster tribal sovereignty, right? I don't think that's, <laughs> well, not too big of an ask, but, you know, as librarians, for our mission statement, you know, our vision statement, we wanted to be clear that we're here, one foot in the house for students, the other foot in the house for tribes but we have to get there. And there's certain things such as indigenous data sovereignty that can bring us together. And so tagline to credit Lana Begay, information is sacred. And so it's sacred because of our values, right? As indigenous people in this space, we're able to have a view of our library to kinship. But my staff, Eric Hardy, I appreciate what he does because when our people come in, yes, quote unquote, they're a patron of the library or a library user or whatever term we use nowadays, but in many ways, there are relatives. Right. And in many ways, the Navajos especially, they're all related with clients. So it's like, oh, I want to help my relative find X, Y, and Z book or X, Y, Z resource. And of course, you're going to go probably the extra mile when you do it from kinship, not that, oh, I have a patron at the desk. I work in public libraries and other. <laughs> so and within that, though, making community, right? To know that we're doing this for this larger reason, um, which is easier when you have Native people there. And then within it, having conversations around consent of sharing that information. And that leads again to this talk of where our young people and even folks who are just not shared with this information may or may not know, like, you know, you put something on this phone and upload it to the gram or, you know, all these platforms, what rights are you giving away, right? What IP is being lost and or the fact that, you know, you're recording grandma on the res and then you upload it on Instagram, it, it should give you that consent. Right, even though maybe it's meant for you and the family, if not you and the world. So just to have that conversation and research, have that conversation in a family archive and so on. And back to I mentioned the view of sovereignty, right? Be able to assert who we are as Native people in this space. So that said, you know, with the uh, kind of message, the foundation now, what I want to get at today is that for us to enact Indigenous data sovereignty, we need to have that localized version of Indigenous librarianship. So like I was saying earlier, it's been going on for decades. Look in New Zealand, you know, the Maori, look at First Nations communities like the Brian Dare system out at UBC. There's folks doing this work, but it's going to be in relation to the lands that you're on. So, for example, there's not going to be one all encompassing definition of indigenous librarianship, like Western you know, librarianship, where it's a monolith. Indigenous librarianship is going to be every tribe, every community, bare minimum in this country, 576 different applications of this. So, what I'm sharing today. On behalf of our, our staff and our library is our version of that, right? So essentially these bullet points are like our mission, like how do we go at it? So we do that with space in place, right? That's important, right? To make spaces or folks to be able to engage in a library where they feel uh, safe, it's a culturally safe space, and a space where they can have critical look, right? Back to what we're talking about with these conversations in their classes, they either they're frustrated with something, with a white academic putting down what they know, where they're from, or just not even knowing past frameworks so past scholars like Brian Deloria, Laura Toki, or Simon Ortiz, or all the academics in Native circles. So like to make a space where that's there is important because again, these spaces were never designed for us, right? So in terms of land back, right? Uh, library space back, you know, we're able to do that with our space. So that Labriola, we have, uh, now we have a 6,000 square feet new renovated space. So I highly recommend coming up, stop opening tomorrow, <laughs> or grand opening on February 7th. But, uh, and this photo doesn't do justice, but we started in this room, at least in my time as director. That said, before I became director, so quote, American Indian Studies uh, terminology, we had a space, and Berlin knows the space, she was there back in the day helping, and it was, before it was renovated, the library, and they renovated the space, and our space was gone. It wasn't prioritized by leadership. Some folks in this room, they just saw the difference, and so, Again, back to my journey and, you know, explaining this, you need advocates, you need people who understand the value of that because of, because of kinship, because of community building. So we advocated and we got this room initially, which has been our home the past year and a half, two years, now to this big 6,000 square feet prime view spot in the library. Again, uh, I recommend coming up when we're open. But yes, that's part of our mission. But within that, obviously, research, 
right? And so how does that link to why they're there in terms of just finding material at an undergraduate level to a PhD level and to know like their search strategies, approaches to be able to support them. That's not just, here's some keywords, you're good to go. Which is again, back to terminology, keywords, all that's been impacted by colonization, right? So you need folks to be able to navigate that. And I don't have my super nerdy search string slide here. Maybe I'll bring it up later, but I have a whole article on this where it breaks down culturally appropriate database searching from a decolonial lens. <laughs> uh, whole other talk. And then obviously books and collections, right? And so having books authored by Native people, having books that um, may not be by Native people, right? Because a lot of books back in the day, there wasn't many Native authors. So how do we have librarians in places where we're able to interpret that, right? Because the younger generation, to their credit, wants Native books from the most conscious woke perspective. And they're like, well, you might have to use that old white man's book from 1950 as a a citation to cite grandma eventually, right? And so like kind of stringing those together where the archive or the special collections book or whatever, it's all has to, you know, be utilized for our knowledge. And then uh, the last slide, programming, which I'll show in a little bit, but we do cool stuff. We do poetry events, we do heavy metal red shows, we do hip hop shows. But when they're there, they get to see themselves, one, on the stage, but two, maybe with the curation of the books there say, hey, it just connects to X, Y, and Z, or what they're talking about in that song relates to whatever, you know, prevalent, you know, activist topic and so on. And lastly, which really is the heart of this talk is around the stewardship, right? How do we, uh, you know, respect indigenous uh, ownership? Coming from a word space as a library that's indigenous, but in academia, so there has to be some ways to navigate that because we're not a tribal library, we're obviously not just a standard white academic library. We're a little bit in the middle, but I'll get into that with our um, next part of the talk. And then with protocols, uh, again, we'll get into that later. So this is a little quick photos again, just showing this is what the space can look like. Keep in mind this table is an optimum furnished table. Those design represent designs from my community and so on. But yeah, to see brown faces in the library and also beyond the library. Right, to show that our knowledge is not just from books, from archives, from the land. So we have a series called the Knowledge from the Land series, where we take folks outside of a you know space like this and say, hey, we're going to learn from folks from Salt River, folks from Hilo River. This is their land, right? And then within that, ties into all this Phoenix history, or basically decolonization is what it amounts to. But this was just a couple of photos, and of course the nerdy academic talks we do too. And again, going out in the mountain, hearing from traditional elders um, about this mountain that's by ASU. So that said, you know, all this builds trust, right? Where the university shows commitment to say, hey, we're gonna hire some folks, not having one person do all the work. And even better, the two librarians on continuing appointment, which is similar to tenure, right? That shows there's a commitment. We're not gonna be fired next year because of the budget or God knows what, which then again, it's Arizona. But within it to say, hey, like we have folks in place, we have space committed, we have uh, understanding of what you're doing. We're not saying no, right? In terms, you can't research or show folks this approach to research, or you know, you're not doing it the right way. So I know in our profession, we tend to get into our ways, <laughs> but to have Native people do the work, right? And so that builds trust because when we get into data sovereignty, institutions have to build that trust. And the best way to do that, obviously, is to fund people like myself and all the folks you've seen to do the work because ultimately everything I showed you up to this point is a point of entry into this larger conversation. And that's, I have to quote Eric Hardy and my staff, that's what we do in our library. We go to point of entry where if you're coming in, either first year, don't know where to go on campus and you see this cool native space, bare minimum, you feel that sense of home and kinship, but then also knowing, hey, I have some difficulties finding, you know, do this paper, or I don't understand why a non-native professor doesn't understand what grandma told me about how the water flows, right? Or, you know, some ecological knowledge from the land. And so that just builds that trust and said, okay, well, let's have these conversations. And then when, within that, be able to connect it to nerdier framework, we'll say. So in the context of the live or archives, right? And this is all gonna relate to now data, right? To me, it's all the same, is that bare minimum, at least from our view of what we're doing now with Vina Begay mainly leading this, we're applying that, you know, through our library, mainly through the uh, actual uh, adopting and now implementing the protocols for Native American archival material. And just uh, show the room, are y'all familiar with the protocol? Yeah, okay. So that in itself is a huge initiative. And, and so having at least the baseline of foundation I mentioned earlier is important because now 
we're able to build that trust to work with community to figure out what needs to stay there and what can be repatriated. And so within the context of ASU this year, where and just like how U of A has something similar, we do have a large, robust native community, and we have folks way above me who are doing works, uh, doing work with, uh, with tribes and you know tribal leaders. So we have a special advisor to our university president. He's actually done awesome. His name's Jacob Moore. And so having everything you saw there to show that why you're relevant to the larger higher native higher ed space within ASU, but also to show, hey, you know, they go for hey, tribal liaisons we have. We need to work with the tribes to then say have reviews of our collection. And so we're in the beginning stages of that. I don't have any photos as we'll say of that other than to say we are working with some typical tribal historical preservation officers right now about some questionable material that's in our collections. And I'm sure all our places have questionable material. But one thing we've learned, especially working with Jacob, is that when you have native people there, it makes the conversation a little smoother, makes it a little more seamless, and makes it a little more to the point because tribal leaders are busy. And so again, we're slowly doing that work. And as we're doing that work, obviously the conversation leads to should this material be here? You know, is it properly described or if they want it to be here? What does restrictions look like? Those are the ins and outs, the weeds of, you know, just trying to get to a place where folks understand that this is the tribe's knowledge, right? It's tribe's information. And in the context of the library, yes, we're talking about uh, photographs, talking about basically random ephemeral material. Yes, we're talking about old books. But within that, it's data, right? And I think to be clear, when we talk about archive data, the quite brave, the quite uh, Brian Brave Boy, you know, it's all the same. These are all our stories, you know. And so that's what we're starting to see as we're implementing the protocol work. It's tied into this thing called indigenous data sovereignty, which, yes, there's clearly defined areas of research where it's quantitative, empirical, where, yes, it's not a book. I get that, <laughs> just to be clear. But in many ways, the approaches, the strategies have to be built on trust. And then also knowing that it's a lot of work, right? And not one person can do it. And maybe we need partnerships along, you know, different types of networks and, you know, sharing with our non-native or our, our non-librarian colleagues, I mean, our research colleagues who are native, we can be allies to that, right? But again, all this is usually what's brought up, right? Data sovereignty, we're going to get TK labels, we're going to do Buka 2. Well, who the hell is going to operate it, right? Who's going to do the TK labels? Who's going to work with community to build them out? You know what I'm saying? So like all these things and on the, li on the librarian side of it, to me, I'm like, well, basically, a library, right? Basically, our it's bare minimum a library component to your big grant, along with the researchers. So, and so, all that said, because if we don't, folks are just going to extract knowledge, and that's why I have this quote from Linda Smith here, who's Maori, because as we're native people are figuring this out, non-native people have been perpetuating, you know, or um, pillaging our knowledge, we'll say. And even though it's 2023, they find find new insidious ways to do that. Uh, without you know getting into the the details, it's just that colonization again is in play, and that's why, like I said earlier, you know we have to have that conversation. And so, to my staff's credit, when we do our information literacy one shot sessions or whatever you want to call it, there's a deep deep dive on decolonization, or what is colonization to begin with. Just even then, the younger generation I feel knows but doesn't know, <laughs> so we just want to be clear how to reach information and why is it important to be sovereign, especially in this space. So that said, the focus more on collections now, you know, again, the taking that land-based approach, now using Aubrey as the case study, uh, and building that relationship with community and tribes, you know, we want to have a land-based culture reform approach to what we do with our collections. So I kind of more or less touched on this a moment ago with working with TIPOs and working with folks who are off them in ASU, um, but that's the work, right? To really stress that this is an awesome hymn doc and force zone. Often in Doc's way of life and our language. And so it'd be like those protocols, those values are what drives our library. Granted, my staff's not all awesome. They're all the net, they're all Navajo, but we share those similar values when we see our knowledge because it's we see it as sacred. And so just having that understanding that, hey, there's stuff that's here that shouldn't be here. We need to go and work with our relatives, our kin, to be able to develop a strategy to best bring them home. Right. And so just to have that frame that way in academia. What I've learned uh, apparently is, you know, radical, but it's kind of like, well, we shouldn't have been here to be here in the first place. And if it is, it's start where we're at. For example, and this is not us in this scenario, like I see institutions gathering native stories and they're thousands of miles away from the land that the stories come from. But it ends up in some repository in, in Indiana 
where it's like, why are all the native songs there? Right? If you were going through a land-based culturally reform approach, you would say, well, maybe they should be closer to home for access purposes, right? Because it speaks to the community's use, not some um, researcher's use. But again, the mentality from Western librarianship is, hey, we want to collect, or all the songs come here, and we're not even talking about IP yet. So for us, we're in the beginning stages, and I have to remind myself, you know, being two years and a couple months in this role, we've got a lot, but there's so much more to do, and also to know that it takes time, right? It takes time to build trust, it takes time to build capacity, it takes time to live and learn, because as we're doing this, you know, we're still figuring out as we go sometimes, or it's a quote, or uh, creating the plan in mid-flight. <laughs> That's academia for you, right? But all that said, back to centering that, back to archives, and this gets now to the community component, which will full circle highlight what I'm getting at with uh, data sovereignty is that for me as an author, you know, this is something my grand, my late grandfather told me is to be awesome to know your emic. And roughly an awesome emic is like your relation, your family tree. And, uh, you know, relating this now to frameworks I've learned now as a librarian, now and I guess the academic or whatever you want to call me, is that I've seen similar methodologies that speak to that, right? And similar methodologies that are like, hey, if you just know your family's history, family's knowledge, you know, you can create space for the next generation or the community, right? And so I remember my grandpa telling me that a long time ago, I didn't really understand it because when you're young, you just want to know everything, right? Oh, teach me this, teach me this. I want to know off them, or I want to know this thing about so and so. But a lot of it is that patience, right? To this go and be in the back of a res car for an hour to go to some village in the middle of Thought Austin to see relatives or help someone with a funeral, right? Or just knowing who's who, what's what, because those, those, uh, your haji and your family is going to be there for you and then share that knowledge, right? And you learn together, not through a book. And so for me, Max, I mentioned Brian, Dr. Brian Braybart earlier, those are stories, right? They're not separate from the data the theories. It's all the same. Right, because there's things I know on my res or any native in this room or online is going to know there's certain things you know that may not equal science and theory, but it's still knowledge, right? So I'm like, hey, wait a minute. So all those things I know about those traditional crossings we go into Mexico and we do our runs, no one knows about <laughs> how the water flows in certain ways, you know, those are stories that might be recorded in cassettes, might be recorded in some field notes or someone, you know, writing something down like a personal journal memoir. And so that said, for us at Labriola, let's see, where's that slide at? I guess that slide's not there. There's another slide here, I'll just leave it on this one, where when I became director and meeting awesome folks like Alana in front of the room down at ASU, um, she was there, uh, that there is a, a initiative called Community Driven Archives. And so uh, another uh, alum here, Nancy Godoy started that about five, well, really 10 years ago, we'll say six when she got her melon grant for it, was to show approach to community memory that's inclusive to family, inclusive to uh, cultural traditional knowledge, inclusive to um, just having that perspective that you know this place that we're at is not the expert. It happens to be here now, right? And so for me as an author, hearing that I'm like, well, it just reminds me of just talking to people, right? Talking to your relatives, and so. For me, when I mean, this is right before I became director at Labriola, but around this time, we adopted that framework. And as we adopted that framework, we realized, you know, for natives, it can be different, right? Because CDA is a methodology, how you work with people, how you center the, the, the community, not the profession or academia. And so for tribes, again, I saw, as, you know, my AIS background as a form of cultural resilience, right? Because then from there, you're able to center that person's experience, that person's knowledge through the archive and starting there compared to the outside looking in. And so to me, I think like Brian's quote here really speaks to that. And so in particular, as we were learning these, doing these workshops, you know, starting off just kind of the, basically debunking what the archive can be and now decolonizing it. And then next phase, indigenizing it. We worked with a handful of tribal librarians throughout the state, a handful of just uh, folks in tribal education departments doing workshops, just general overviews of you know, what a community archive can be. And one in particular is this young woman here, one of our former students, um, who, who's Theachit Awesome. And those who are unfamiliar with Theachit Awesome, they're unrecognized. Um, and so their history, um, in many ways, they had to, like, uh, I guess, be enrolled in other, uh, other Awesome tribes, but technically they don't have land. 
They don't have any recognition. But her this community, though, is in the process of doing that. And for those unfamiliar with the Office of Federal Acknowledgement in the Department of Interior here in the U.S., uh, part of your petition to be a recognized tribe, you have to have an archive. And so in that sense, our student worker, Lord is here, Lulu for short, she just learned about everything I said, blown away, opened her eyes, and keep in mind, she's like 19 years old, right? And she's like, oh my God, like this is what we need for what we're doing in our community. And so that said, through trust now, back to what I mentioned earlier, seeing what La Riola was all doing as a whole, and it wasn't an extractive space, it was a space to cultivate cultural resilience. She embraced it more and went down the rabbit hole about archives, the rabbit hole, the nerdy stuff we do here at the high school. And within that, picked up the, the techniques, the skills needed to begin to archive her community's collection that was in the hot garage way out here on the side of Tucson. <laughs> So you know, knowing that, hey, this, these preservation kits or this uh, mylar and all those things you need on the archive side, they have a place. And then again, going through leadership um, by chance, her mom's the chairwoman of the tribe currently and leads the governing body. And so getting that buy-in from her and all their leadership to see, hey, like this can be beneficial to the cause. Bare minimum, it's helping preserve, you know, what they need, but also know that it's needed. Right, and then for what they're doing with tribal or their recognition to be a mean for self determination, and so this is just a picture of some of her stuff and the photo, or let's see that one right here. It's interesting because back to the information being all sorts of formats. That's more or less a zine her grandma made her. People are her a zine that her grandma made for other relatives in the past to learn a story in Austin, and it's like her version of her, her way of spelling it out in Austin. Now some photos, and then this book, which is the U.S. Parks book here. Uh, Park Service book that basically says that the Piazza and Austin won't be here any longer. So you have basically a narrative of extinction against her, but also you saw her family there. And so that said, she implemented that work and to the point where she um, helped work, mainly them, but it helped where I could with them. They got a separate grant to digitize some tapes um, for their archive. There's a whole oral history tape, or this is their setup. But permission, I'm sharing this. And so, like, all that work that a young woman did in this garage. <laughs> and then, you know, learning how to scan photos, which she learned at the workshops we taught. And also, they're recognizing the need to digitize and preserve some tapes that were there. And so, that there's her setup. Um, and so, learning just the nerdy DPI stuff too, and high resolution and all that. So, that's a process. Um, so, all that led to them doing the work. I guess me serving as a consultant, because on my end, technically, she worked for us, but then it's her own time, um, helped them out, and that's when it led to a conversation of, well, we want ASU's help, but we don't want to give you a stuff, which I 100% agree that I would not want that to happen, but we need people, we need um, some capacity, basically, because uh, one hand, it's important what she's doing uh, on by herself, but she's a young woman, just graduated uh, last year, and now she wants to go to law school, so she doesn't have all the time in the world, and also, this is the reality of our communities. So we have to think bigger. How can we find a way to build a partnership or some approach where we can get people, right? And also uh, take into account all the considerations. And so that led to well, working mainly with her community. We received the $1 million Mellon Grant um, to essentially create a community-based participatory archive. And what that means is that uh, to build on the framework of CDA is to build an archive where we're listening and as an institution, because ultimately, I realize health and ASU is that we need to do this in a way that's going to take into account their property, their rights, cultural rights, uh, intellectual property rights, but in a way, too, that, you know, we can be a good steward, right, or a good, um, sorry, partner with their capacity. Because the reality in tribal communities, and this is across the board, I was just at the ATOM conference two weeks ago, we lack definitive digital preservation uh, infrastructure. I mean, there's, there's stuff there, and I have to take away from it, but you know, we're growing the native people, but repositories, consortiums, you know, all that, that's still new with tribes. We're really trying to keep our water, right? We're really, you know, keeping our kids from being took away for the foster system and so on. So in the list of things with tribal nations, it is important, but, you know, we're, we're, we're at where we're at. And so with this grant, we hope to show that we can, as an institution, a native library in, in ASU, a space that can um, house material maybe, right? Or have a partnership where we can process and help 
as long as the intellectual property concerns are addressed. And so that's why that man on the left of the photo, or yeah, left, yeah, left of the photo, that's Trevor Reed. He's Hopi, he's at the Sandra Day Law School, and he's an indigenous intellectual property lawyer. And so as we're going through the collections work, everything that she did and with our you know, guidance of identifying material, he's helping write MOUs, MOAs, legal agreements where we can best handle the material, process the material, uh, just be able to get in there without having a need of gift. Because as we know in this room, that's a one-way street of a session. Now we're on to the Board of Regents here at ASU or uh, U of A, and that's it. We didn't want that. So basically what I'm getting at is we had to pursue a grant that had to take into account all of those things and basically uh, put the institution in its place, right? Just to have that, that guidance there. Uh, so yeah, and then ultimately it's to move it to, like I was saying earlier, everybody wants these things, but you need people to build it out. And so that led to the Fire Keepers Initiative, which is essentially a three-year project. I kind of already described it to establish its, uh, collections in accordance to community and data sovereignty of tribal nations. So, oh, that's where the slide was at. So that was the roots of it, right? It's everything I said earlier when I was saying how we got here. Um, and so within that, obviously it's about memory keeping, centering our lived experience, doing it where it's not just an archive, it's an inter, you know, intergenerational space for us to learn and grow, whether that's learning a language or using it for tribal recognition. All of these things have a deeper meaning for Native people here. And so that said, we have a whole other team of lab building now. So I mentioned the four earlier, and now we have three, or as of now, Alicia Penrose, because they work for Labriola, uh, Trevor is the lawyer I mentioned. So we're getting staff. And so back to what I was saying earlier with data sovereignty, all this, what I said is a lot, even probably for folks here at the high school. So within that, we need folks to be dedicated. And so like Alicia, who's also a PhD student at ASU, she's helping as, as our education specialist, the scaffold, break down all this nerdy talk. So we can meet people where they're at. And so similar to what we do in our library space, we need people on the ground doing that work with partners like Tia Chidawasa and others that we're working with now and on awesome. And then within that, we start working for an archivist. So hint, hint, and we'll have a post soon looking for an archivist. Um, and then lastly, um, we have Penrose Fullwater, who's from Salt River, and he's our awesome language specialist. So as we're teaching community, all this stuff, all these considerations, hearing what they need, and based on that, Alicia, you know, designing modules or workshops, whatever is best to educate folks with on, then uh, they know what to do, right? So they have free prior informed consent. It's a big thing in Native communities, uh, free prior informed consent. And then once they know what this archive thing is and how it can be used, right, then we have our archivists who will organize it, again, recruiting. And then as we're organizing it, how do we describe it? Or how do we flag protocols, right? How do we uh, you know, uh, take into account indigenous awesome perspectives. That's where Penrose comes in, along with translating and doing transcription work and so on. So you have to have a team to build it out and all that needs to be rooted with Trevor here just to get the legal agreements down. So it's good to have lawyers and grants, I'll say that. And so I know we're kind of on time, but um, as far as, you know, again, having these conversations around data sovereignty, these are the questions that folks sometimes don't know fully right, or they know parts of it. And so when you're working with tribes within a library setting or even a research setting, you know, our knowledge is all these things here, right? And obviously the researchers come at it from a different perspective. Us on the other hand, it gets into an organi organization question, right? Or, um, you know, how do we describe it and so on. Um, but this is important. And so this is kind of some slides actually from the workshops that we do with uh, in the Mellon Grant. Just to be clear, right, all this stuff that historically has ended up in spaces like our in academic libraries has this, this knowledge there, right, it has this traditional knowledge. And back to Vina's work. So I guess to be clear, this Mellon Grant's external for what we're at Labriola is doing. But Vina Begay's dealing with protocol work, that's internal, right? That's the stuff that we inherited before we even you know, had the jobs, right? So you got to do it right. And so back to relations, back to trust building, Working with tribes, it goes a long way to say, hey, tribal communities, we're doing our best to repatriate, uh, but also doing our best to help your, your needs, right? Because again, tribes have just as much digital needs as anybody else, it's just that there's no one to do it, right? Or a tribal library is not do, viewed in a certain context or, or, or way, but ultimately we're here to protect our information because for us as, as awesome or indigenous people in general, it's a responsibility to do this work, right? It's not, we're doing it for, our own reasons, you know, it's to create that space to share that knowledge and to do it right. 
And one example I always say is young, uh, younger folks who work with us, especially with these devices, you know, back to consent, is that, you know, it's our responsibility to know how these things are being used. Because I always use the analogy, this was 1923, some old white man rolled up with their big ass cameras they were using back then. They went up to the tribe and said, hey, here's where you get a picture, right? This thing called a photograph. And, you know, you guys can take as many cameras as you want. Right, we were around the community, and of course, natives like, "Oh, this is cool, right? Take photos of the land, my family, family portraits, all those family things." But then the only kick would be, you can do all that, but I'm keeping the negatives, right? So I'm going to own the IP. Yes, you can have as many the copies or surrogates, whatever you want. But that said, would our people say yes to that? Right? I think of Edward Curtis, though, right? Or it has happened historically, and all that stuff ended up in the institution. But I was thinking back to being you know, wary and mindful, we got to read the fine print and everything with Native people. And so those things, no one probably told us that. We just thought it was a cool photo. Then it ends up in some institution or Arizona State Museum, whoever, right? So that said, we're in the same place with these things. It's, you know, TikTok, Instagram, Dropbox, or whatever, all that stuff you just click on, you don't read it. There's no digital literacy there. And so back to this conversation with Mellon or the grant we have, we're sharing that the best that we can to inform them. This is why we're not just gonna put this on some open access platform. This is maybe why Mupitu is important, right? This is why these protocols are important. And so, and this gets into the IP side, right? This is more of a thing that Trevor breaks down, but you know, having that conversation about protecting those memories. And I feel back to responsibility, whether it's 1923 or 2023, you gotta have that conversation. And you might be the doom and gloom librarian saying no, but we got to protect our knowledge because that's going to end up on the ground. Or this is probably deep dive here, indigenous futurism. I always feel like all the stuff that we give rights to right nowadays, it's going to be open access data sets 50 years from now, 20 years from now, probably. And we'll have a whole wave of digital anthropology folks coming in, data mining that with AI. And then they're going to have everything they need because we just gave up our rights. Right, because we didn't ask. And so again, this is why with Mellon or this grant we have along with data sovereignty, this is the work, right? To educate folks on these conversations and hopefully we'll have a chance because ultimately it's tied into everything we do with native people, right? And you know, we're still sharing these things for oral way, oral learning, you know, through our you know uh, traditional ways, we'll say, and then adopting new things like this. I mean, this can bring so much. Right, good, bad, and ugly. You could record a rap album on here if you wanted to, right? Or do some videos or something, and it'd be important. But you have to know what it is and what's the OS uh, propriety rights on this operating system, right? So there's a lot that it's a responsibility, but ultimately it is for culture resilience. Because this photo here, back to Yachid Awesome, after that young woman helped lead an initiative to digitize 420 tapes with the Pima County Arts Grant, um, there's tapes going back from the 1970s in there, elders of the long past that we went to the site by the border, which is a sacred site, with permission to share this photo, and they played those songs or that those tapes there. And for them, it was a very powerful moment to be like, well, like this, this is recorded here in 1977. Now we have it out here on the ground. And so now this is how we need to carry it on. And so in many ways we're, you know, breaking bread, but it was some of the roots of the Mellon grant kind of came sitting around over here. You know, the spring that's sacred to us is awesome. And right around the corner is the border, the other side of that bush. And they deal with that. And that's the why, right? If we don't do this, they're going to demolish who we are. They're going to pave this, this, this border over us. So yeah, it's it means a lot, you know, in that way. And I get back to why I'm doing this talk now. It fosters this, right? Everything I just said could be applied the same level of care same level of finding ways to make accessible, the same level of respect, the same level of, you know, making this engaging with community. That to me is what fosters digital data sovereignty, not no book, right, or going to conferences or summits only. It's all of the above. And I feel as librarians and archivists, we have an opportunity to put our skill sets in that space because sometimes our, our folks, maybe on the research side, they don't think about all that stuff. They're like, oh, we'll put it in a repository. We're good. Well, who the hell is going to build it out? Right? Who's going to do the work? And even then, build those relationships with community. Because it takes a lot, like you saw here. And again, I only shared that example I shared because 
that to me is ultimately uh, you know supporting community memory and, and centering community memory and protecting community memory's rights. And you look at any data sovereignty paper, they're all going to say that. Ten pages long to say it though. So that said, um, yeah, it's all the same to me. <laughs> And ultimately, I feel to making those connections full circle at the beginning of this talk. So now, you know, that conversation of decolonization cultural resilience. I'm not going to sit here and be all activists and you can't do this. We're going to decolonize everything because systems inherently flawed. But how do we find ways that the cultural resilience works in that? And I feel libraries are an awesome thing. Uh, long story short, with the gains at ASU, they can't give us a cultural center apparently, but they can help provide a space for indigenous research services for space for cultural resilience. So you gotta play the game a little bit, but within that, you gotta be at the table and represent uh, for your, your, your students there, uh, tribal members, folks you work with, community, but also to know it's about tribal nation building, right? That's the bigger vision, not just to make the university look good or the university you know, library look good. It's, it's because we're being good relatives, right? In relation to land and kinship, like I said earlier, for those reasons of the sovereignty, whatever that means. In this case, it's federal recognition or uh, federal recognition. In other cases, it might just be, um, you know, language work or something. I don't know. Every community is different, but you got to start somewhere to make those connections. So I think that's my talk. So I'm going to shut up now. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Alan, for that was great. Uh, I want to open up the room to questions. If folks have questions or comments. Uh, questions about the work or about the projects that are happening and I'll be taking them from uh online as well. Yeah, go ahead. Um Gopanit, Nico Sanchez, Juna Hai Shimane, and we have both Turn as the Coquito Mexico. Um hi, my name is Nico Sanchez. My maternal grandmother is Miss Color Apache Sanquana. And my paternal grandmother is from Coquito Mexico. Um I'm our digital design fabrication specialist for Catalyst Studios in the library. Um a question, well, thank you for your talk. Um, for other institutions looking to do something similar as what you've done with um, the library of the space, um, what would you, what advice would you give to them who are trying to start something that's similar to what you guys do at ASU? Well, this gets to my administrative hat now. <laughs> um, it's ultimately prioritizing funds, right? I mean, we can talk that we want this and that, or be uh, diverse, uh, equitable, and inclusive. But if you don't have that buy-in at that level, it's not going to go far. Or at best, you'll get money or funding for one person. Yeah. And then you got to do everything we just talked about. And keep in mind, there was about a six, well, like nine-month period where I was at. And so, <laughs> but here we are. And so I think it's a combination of just uh, putting their amount, their money, or you know, putting what they're saying into play in their strategic planning, right? To say, hey, if we want to do these big initiatives, we have to put dollars up and know it's going to build. Because once you let the genie out the bottle, it's going to grow, right? And then knowing that as far as back to relationships and, and um, community building trust, you can't say you're going to do one thing and as it grows, that so you can't do it, right? So you kind of have to be mindful of the growth too, or just have some plan as prioritized, because if not, it's going to be doomed to fail. And additionally, back to endowed funds, like we said, we started as an endowment. So our engagement and our collections and like general operating budget is for that. So that, that does give autonomy, right? Because it's been around for 30 years. And now as we're growing, it's some more money, but it can be uh, pivotal because other times, other units of my, my colleagues, they have to ask every time. For me, we have that. I mean, as a director, I make that call. Uh, that said, within the university, there's a permanent uh, commitment of staffing. And like I mentioned earlier, the librarian archivist side, whether uh, will tenure to be playing the tracks. If it's not, they're just cutting corners, saving money. So I don't know really to answer your question, yeah. but yeah, it comes down to money. Yeah. We have a question from uh, Bob Jacob on Monday. Uh, he states that the concept of indigenous data sovereignty overlaps much of my career as a data engineer, including information security. And my current education is non indigenous in Tonatum studies. At TOCC, uh, which is the Town Outcome Community College. I'm very interested in learning more about how I can help bring my background in data to help the Indigenous people, Town Outcome, Pakiyaki, et cetera, on whose lands I now reside. So the question is how can uh, Bob Jacob bring his background in data 
and is here to help indigenous folks. So it sounds like you signed up to build the uh, the network for us, huh? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that's the other part of this. So I guess the piggyback off that, the answer the question, I hope, as we get more native librarians, we're going to need more native coders, more native uh, programmers, more native this repository backend people. And so that's the... I say fun because that'd be kind of cool to know on the res you got a whole like tech team, right? Or awesome or whatever tribe. But uh, it's just knowing how they all connect. Because I think one apparent main uh, apparent area you can see this is like in the uh, broadband work, digital equity work, where you know, it's all in COVID. Um, you know, this one thing to have a library and anything it's wired. And we have probably have friends or colleagues that we know that do that work at a federal level because there's so much with that to get broadband, to get internet. Because then you can't have move it to, we don't have access, right? And so it gets into those more nerdier conversations of like the digital cultural heritage work. And uh, I don't know the person's school background, but it sounds like they'll have a role. But the issue I feel is that our tribes don't know that yet, right? I mean, they do, but they don't. Because again, they're busy. I'm not, again, taking away from decisions or priorities, but I mean, this is not going away, right? So if you're having data for your own tribal needs, Right and or researchers or an archive, you're going to have to start thinking that out. So I feel the next five to ten years, that's going to be the case. Starting with broadband, because now the red is wired. Who's going to manage it? Or we're going to outsource it? But if you outsource it, it's that tribal sovereignty, right? It gets to the whole thing. If you can't grow your own food, if you're not sovereign. Well, if you can't govern your own digital cultural heritage, you're not sovereign, right? And that's the standard AIS framework. But yeah, so I think the guy signed up for a lot, a lot of work. <laughs> well, Bob, Bob is out at TOCC, so he might run across the list. And he knows Liz, so yeah, I'll work with her. So. Okay, we have, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, and then we have another one. Okay. I, I thought seven questions. What's up? <laughs> All right, so I'm a PhD student, and I'm on the machine learning side of this program, but in my former life, I was a historian and librarian. And I saw a lot of times when I was working with students with the Micmac Seattle community that we knew in Canada, Steve Brunson, when, when um, or even with Latin communities, in the South Coast. When you do queries online for whatever it is you're doing, your stuff usually is Google fielding a lot. All right. So so the the program, the information you do with all of that stuff is very Northwestern Eurocentric. What are you guys doing right now to make that less so? I'm 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 really sad that I didn't recruit my uh, include my super nerdy search things in here in terms of retrieval with ProQuest, EBSCO, Scopus, uh, the web of, uh, sci or, yeah, web of Science, Engineering Village, that back to the research part of Libriola. And I take more lead on like working with uh, faculty or PhDs. Um, yeah, there's a conversation of knowing the technology, right? Apparently it's not native produced, but here we are in a place to use it. And then knowing that it's how it's um, subject heading and indexing and all that, it's all non-indigenous. So how do we decolonize that approach where instead of just putting Thon Awesome, you're putting Papago, or Akam Awesome, you're putting Pima or Navajo and Diné, keeping in mind the accent on the E usually gets dropped. So you're looking at the net and the uh, the dine. <laughs> I've seen it before. And then knowing how you plug that all together to be strategic when you're doing a search string and scaffold it down where the graduate student understands it. And so on our end, we're doing our best to have those conversations when we're doing workshops, right? I usually time to time, um, and then people hit me up faculty wise, we'll basically do like a indigenous research 102 workshop. And it's getting into the weeds of everything you're getting into because STEM, especially uh, STEM databases suck with indexing. <laughs> and there's so much colonial terminology in there. And so I'm working with a colleague now where we're writing, we have a paper on this essentially with the STEM case study along with the general case study to social sciences, wow, wow, west of indexing, and then you throw it in ProQuest, EBSCO, then they change every year, and then they get rid of the asterisks, or they get rid of some command code, Boolean language, and so on. So yeah, we're trying our best to just introduce what that even is, and then kind of have a conversation with our native educators, of like, well, we should engage machine learning, yeah. right? Or is it an AI thing, right? So I'm, I'm open to this very futurism conversation, but we're barely getting here. <laughs> Um, I do have one more question, and um, to piggyback off of it. So, when there are data sets out there, and they were collected by people who are not indigenous, you can't recollect the data because maybe it was 17th, 18th, 19th century data. But you have a data set, and I, I use the word "kept old" for the means here. How do you decolonize that? Should you decolonize that, or should you augment it? What do you do with something like that? 
he gave it back. So he gave it back. Well, it, it's I know it's out there. Is the point? Yeah. It's just you now that it's out the bottle, but. I was at ATOM and this was brought up a lot two weeks ago. That's Association of Tribal Libraries, Archives, and Museums Conference. And with books and archives, it's pretty straightforward, right? Or obviously human remains, who of them, people. And the data size, it gets interesting because we were talking about that as native librarian and archivist there, where yeah, it's it's out there. But so out of that example, an institution like U of A or ASU might have you know some access database description, whatever. And granted, this might be more, uh, I don't know, uh, symbolic than uh, uh, not, but like as a university, you shouldn't subscribe to that. You shouldn't be paying these people the money or whatever I don't know what the access point would be, right? If it's a firewall or something. But to make a very clear commitment, we're not going to use this. It's not, it's not ethical. This is going to be past IRB. Granted, will the standard be the same back east because they have no interaction with the natives and or in Europe or around the world? No, because I see that a lot, but awesome because our data with diabetes has been ransacked the past 50 years. And if you Google Akamo Awesome right now on ProQuest, you're going to get a shitload of articles that are just all science and genetic stuff that are comparing awesome like we're just guinea pigs. And then the average awesome searches that, right? They want to learn their culture. And I'm like, well, I saw all these random articles from Europe, China, and God knows where. I'm like, because someone, the data set. And they're asking me these questions. So I have to like break that down. And they're like, well, why don't I just give it back or make a commitment to get rid of it? See, so that's a larger open access conversation that we don't want to give up. That's the whole power and control conversation. So I guess to answer it, I just say give it back or just burn it, destroy it. That's how old school I am. But you know, I know it has some value somewhere. And maybe the tribes can decide that not the person that attracts it. Yeah. So that relates, uh, I think, to this question that Kristen is asking online. Kristen is a current MA student in the Library Science Program and Knowledge River Scholar. Uh, she's asking, first of all, thank you for this, and says, in the grant-funded work that you're doing, did you have to stipulate that there might be some work that you or your staff, um, that you or your staff did, that you would not report about or make public in order to protect Indigenous knowledge? And if so, how would you advocate for that privacy when the climate pushes for open access? One, uh, we'll, we'll test them. Hopefully, no one's not on the call. But uh, <laughs> I'm, I've been transparent about this because we fall under the public knowledge component of Mellon. And I said from the get go, I said, well, that's not going to fly. So, one, redirect me to the appropriate unit within Mellon so I can apply and or to know my definition of public knowledge is often public. My definition of uh, public knowledge is also thought off the public, the object public. So it's public, it's just not public, general public. So they said they were cool with that. So within that, of course, when I do my reporting soon enough, because that's coming up next month, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, just to have that conversation, because I see Mel, you know, as you know, Mellon funds a lot of cool initiatives around the world, it seems. And so, like, the US, especially where they are forward facing, and I, I hope open to that. Um, but yeah, that's again, this is uncharted territory for some because it's always open. But yeah, that's my only answer at this time. Ask me next year. <laughs> we have a couple of comments also that says data is difficult to control once it's been copied, which I think you referred to. Um, and someone else says, Jessica that says, yes, give it back without question. Uh, and Bob mentions that he does know Liz and will we'll connect with them. <laughs> oh, she needs help. Yeah, the <laughs> army out there. Any other questions or? Uh, some uh, Jamie Flood online asked if you would be willing to share your search strings. Uh, so Jamie, I don't know if you want to clarify what you mean by that. I think the search string might be specific to your research. Well, now I get to be an academic and point my articles here. Um, <laughs> no, there's a what is the title? researching Native American or search strategies for Native Americans. Look in the, I'm assuming here it will come up. I'm the lead author. It's an applied article, keep in mind. Um, but yeah, it's four of us on the paper. And so, um, to your point of the search string per institution, the terminology and the, what's it called, the, the, the string itself, that can be applied to any institution that has, say, ProQuest or EBSCO. That was the case study example within our paper, because we looked at those as very generalized databases that can give us a good idea of. Um, uh, subject headings because a colleague of ours did similar work in the 90s, and this was around the time the UN adopted the 
more official terminology of indigenous peoples compared to Native American. So at the time, they looked into, hey, well, is that how's that impacting library ownership? So we did the paper, predominantly it was still the American Indian, Native in North America, and so on. So fast forward in 2019, 2020, whenever the paper came out, we did the sole review. We reviewed thousands and thousands of articles to see what are the trends, and nothing's changed. It's still Indians in North America and or American Indian. Uh, yes, indigenous people are more prominent. Yes, First Nations, Aboriginal, other ones are emerging. But again, having a search string that has all of it. So, for example, I have this massive search string that includes every identifier you can imagine of natives, and then you connect it to the territory what you're looking at. Depending with Otham, Dene, some of the tribes in our, you know, Highly uh, regular users at Labriola, I have those set up for them. But it's in the article how to do it. So I can send it to you after the talk. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Maybe just to this position at all and what are you looking for uh, ideally? I hope that you know there are usually the students in various library settings that are interested in applying, but uh maybe just speak a little bit more about the position you built. Um generally speaking, because I'll say we did try to recruit a while back, didn't go as well, so we're opening it. Um just to have a very uh, general understanding of indigenous approaches to um, archives, which is easier said than done because there's only a handful of us out in the field and not many examples. But a person that can take into account how to work with the community, to listen, um, to know, you know, obviously have the basic skill sets here of Western approaches, like having all that in mind, but knowing that can be tweaked, right? Knowing that, you know, we'll use it as a framework. Um, because with Mellon, we hope uh, is that this is where the archivists come in to develop our own schemas, the metadata. Um, I've seen some attempts in, around here and elsewhere where, on one hand, I'm glad often words are being used, right? We're talking about terminology. But it's still within the Western system. So it's just like window dressing. Looks cool though, right? Often awesome. see a word, it's a language. But how does that relate to the STEM, you know, schema? Right. So someone understands how to develop or general idea of schemas and get to bring up this term Dublin core and all that stuff or how to get around it. <laughs> but uh, and then obviously this uh, community uh, experience with this, you know, metadata, right? Just tags and knowing that can be converted to uh, control vocabulary and then based on Lupa 2, you know, that will rip both out. It's one thing I've shared with Autumn awesome communities, especially is that at least in our tribe, I can't speak to Navajo or anywhere else. Our language circle, it's like language war sometimes. Everybody has their own way of spelling it, certain dialects, they talk fast, they talk slow, whatever. And that's fine and dandy. I'm not fluent in Autumn, awesome, but I know my people. But I'm like, someone on the back end is going to have to use that language for metadata. So it's going to be a whole like awesome metadata portion. <laughs> because if it's a more awesome librarian, the awesome awesome, and say, oh, it's the way we do it, it's our schema. You actually they're going to say different. And then we're not even from in Spanish. So also someone that's potentially maybe trilingual too, which is cool. Uh, and also, yeah, with the awesome uh, language specialist, he'll help with that, right? But the more awesome you know, that would be great. So a native person in general will be fine. Be honest though, I mean, allies to our community, someone who understands everything I just said. Because again, there's not many of us. It's hard, it's, it's hard to recruit right now. So I don't know that answers all your questions. And Muka too. Was it 557 you guys use that? I remember? Yeah. That's when I use Muka too, yeah. So, all right. Is that it? Any other questions? Okay, no. You got bookmarks, got stickers, uh, artwork for your space. Want to check it out? Sorry, online. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time, Alice. We really appreciate you being here.